Let's try that again. Good morning. Man, it is so good to be together with all of you. It is so good. I know we're in the middle of this pandemic and things are so weird. And can I just pay you all a compliment right off the jump? It takes bravery, kind of on another level of bravery, to show up to a new place. We're called the Crossway Church. We're a brand new church. That's already brave. Can we turn this down a little, please? This is really hot. Okay. So it's already brave showing up to a new place like this. Welcome to Crossway Church, by the way, where the problems of life meet the power of God. That's our tagline. And it's more than just a tagline for us. It's actually our history. All right. Is this going to get better? All right. It's actually our history. So 25 of us moved here to Columbia to plan a church, to start this, to see God do amazing things in this community, in the surrounding areas, and hopefully what we do here can eventually impact to the ends of the earth. That's the idea. We want to plan a church that will grow, transform people's lives in the community, train those people to go out and plant more churches. That's our goal. Everything that we pray for you this morning is not that you will be blessed and stop there, but we pray that you'll be blessed in such a way that you will then get up and go bless someone else. That's the vision of Crossway. We don't want to just be another church that does all the same things. Where we get up and we sing songs and we have this great performance. And and we have this speaker that stands up and he says all the nice things that we want to hear. If that's what you're looking for, you might find a pretty good performance. Our singing group is pretty good, okay? And they're getting better every day. Your preacher's all right. But if you're looking for a family... A place where people will love you through thick and thin and will care about you and be concerned about you and will help you grow and develop, then this is the place for you. Those aren't just words. We mean that with all of our heart. And we are very mindful that someone did that for us. The 25 members of this church that started this this church, they could tell you some incredible stories of where they were before God. Until someone introduced Jesus into their lives. And now we are completely different people. We're not perfect. We are still growing. But we are way different than we were before Jesus. And if you're looking for something better. You're tired of where life has been. You're in the right place. If you'll open your mind and open your heart. I think Jesus can meet you here. We're in the middle of a series, uh, not really in the middle, we had one lesson so far. So if you're like, oh man, we're in the middle, we're not in the middle, okay? You only missed one lesson, and really this, this lesson will stand alone just fine on its own. But our series is titled Under Armour, and you see our little logo up here, Performance Apparel. And it's based out of Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to start there this morning. And what I want you to do is open up your bulletin, you got one when you came in you'll notice that there are some sermon notes inside. This will both help you follow along uh, when I get a little boring. All right, it'll keep you awake. And then also, hopefully, if you fill that out and and you use it to take notes, you'll be able to take it home with you and reflect on it later. And that's our prayer for you, that out of everything you get today, that God's word be the dominating thing that you take away. And so let's dive into God's word this morning as we continue our series, Under Armour. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, and on your notes, I'm going to make a slight correction. It says it's in the New Living Translation. You see the little parentheses? It says NLT. You can change that. This is actually in the NIV. Just FYI. It says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take your stand and stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. 
And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So this is our text, and it's going to be for the next several weeks. And so each week, we're going to highlight a different portion of this text, and we're going to kind of unpack that idea. And so this week, we're going to focus in on the idea of the belt of truth, that particular piece of armor. Before we do that, before we dive in and start talking about this belt, though, I want to reemphasize something. If you notice on your notes, you'll see that I broke down all the words, uh, all the times where the word against appeared in this text. Count them. How many is it? Help me out. All right. Oh, what? Seven. That's right. I cheated and put uh, a couple of them on the same line, so you got to pay attention there. But anyway, um, what I want you to do is go back up to the main text, and on your notes, I want you to circle every time the word against appears, and it should help you out. I kind of highlighted those in, in that green color, okay? So circle those all the times where you see the word against. Now, what does that tell you? Paul said, you're against this, you're against that, you're also against this, and these things are against you, and what is happening? And he even gives you a couple of things that you're not against. He says, this isn't against flesh and blood. Your enemy is not the people who are doing mean things to you, okay? The people who you struggle with forgiving, your battle's not really with them. Our enemy, the devil, Satan, wants you to think your battle is with people, But God is trying to get us to see that your battle is actually not with people at all. It's not with flesh and blood. It's against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of of the darkness of this age. It's against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And it's against the schemes of the devil. And here's the thing, guys. Our problem is we don't put on the armor of God very often. And so we're unprotected. But why do we not put it on? Because we don't believe we're in a battle. Who woke up this morning and go, all right, I'm stepping into the battlefield today. I mean, who, who really wakes up? The first thing you think is, man, I got to put my helmet on before I get, you know, popped. Bullets are flying in the spiritual sense. These spiritual bullets are flying and I'm on the battlefield. See, we don't put the armor on because we wake up so casually as if there isn't an enemy out to get us. As if there isn't someone who's out to kill us and harm us. But God is trying to get us to see there actually is. You know, the churches in the United States are on the decline. You say, why in the world do we need another church? Why are you planting a church in Columbia? Why would we plant any churches anywhere in the United States? Some people might ask. And I can tell you, I've seen the numbers. They're depressing. Sure, there are some large churches. There are some mega churches that we would call them. And it looks like they're thriving they got these magnificent buildings and these facilities are just top notch. And they've got professional speakers and they've got professional singers and they've got all these things. And the the children's programs, man, I went to a church that had a merry-go-round in the children's wing of the church building. They also had an ice cream parlor. Now, is there anything wrong with that? No, I wish we had one. Okay, that would be awesome. I would ride the merry-go-round with the kids, okay? I think that's awesome. But here's, here's the thing. You can go to a lot of places and you can see large numbers of people and you can then be fooled into thinking that is success. But when you dig in deep and you start realizing that really all these big churches largely have done is attracted other people that already know about God and they just prefer this service over the one they used to attend. And so what you have is churches growing simply by church shopping. All the while, people in the world who know nothing about Jesus, know nothing about God, know nothing of the hope of the nations that we sing about, they continue to die and remain lost and disconnected from God's family. But man, we're doing church. And I call that, guys, playing church. And if you look at your notes, I put this. Christianity is a battleground, not a playground. We're not here to put on a good show. We're here to save people's lives. And to tell people how our lives have been saved. 
that we're nothing special, but the God that we serve is incredibly special. And he's incredibly powerful. And he wants to take care of us. He wants us to know that this is a battleground, but he gives us this armor. And notice, if you go back to the text, the main text there in Ephesians chapter 6, the first thing he says in verse 11, he says, put on the full armor of God. And that, that phrase, put on, in the Greek, is the word in duo. And it is a military command. Okay, It's what they would have used in the Roman army to say... Put this on. Completely cover yourself. Be endowed. Be completely endued. And we know something else about this. And maybe this doesn't mean a lot to you. But if you're an English major, maybe this might mean something. Or a Greek uh, scholar, if we have any of those in the audience. This is used in the aorist tense. The aorist tense. And what that does for us is it tells us that our outfit is not something that we have to purchase. It's something that's provided. And yet, you have to choose to put it on. God is not going to, when you decide to follow him, he's not just going to put it on you. He says, you've got to choose this. You have to to consciously and intentionally choose to put this armor on. And so, we have, you know, under armor... Anybody ever bought Under Armour clothing? Yeah, you got to pay for that stuff, man. That stuff's not cheap, right? Unless you go to the outlets or something, you might get a deal. But Under Armour's not cheap. And can I tell you that the, the armor of God is also not cheap? It's free. It's provided to you free of charge. But it doesn't mean it was cheap. Jesus purchased this armor with his blood so that you could have it. So that you could be protected in this battle. But we have to choose to put it on. Now, let's get to the belt of truth. You know, some of you are like, man, can't we get to the sword of the spirit? Man, can't we talk about shields? You know, like Captain America, he's got his shield and he throws it at people. And he's like, oh, can't we talk about one of those pieces? Why we got to talk about the, the belt? Who's wearing a belt right now? Raise your hand. Is it nice? Who, who wants to model a belt real quick? Come up and model a belt. Come up here, man. Come on, Dimitri. This is our youth minister. He, he can model for us. Let's see that belt, boy. Is it looking good? <laughs> Let's see that belt. Let's see that belt. Woo! Give him a hand. <laughs> man, anybody else got a pretty belt? I got a belt. Look at that. Boy, it matches my shoes. You see that? That's nice. See, when you think of a belt, you think that's not very exciting. Why? Because you think about a little leather strap with a little buckle, and it holds maybe your pants up. But maybe your pants would have stayed up just fine, and it's really just an accessory. It just matches your shoes or your shirt or something, right? That's how we think about a belt. It's kind of almost an afterthought in our apparel. But you see, here's the thing. Paul is writing from prison when he writes this. So it is very likely that he's either under guard from a Roman soldier, or maybe even possibly this happened, he may be even chained to a Roman soldier while he is writing what we are now reading. So I think he had in mind a different kind of belt. I think it looked more like this, and if you notice, this belt is achieving more than just a fashion statement. It's holding a sword. It's holding a little dagger it's also supporting the breastplate so that it can fit there it also had a notch where the shield could rest this belt provided more than just holding up someone's pants and more than just a fashion statement and so when we talk about the belt of truth notice it is the first piece that is mentioned in the armor It is the first because everything else is connected to it. Everything else relies on it. And this isn't just any belt. It is the belt of truth. The number one way we combat our enemy. The number one way we fight in this battle is we fight lies with truth. So why is the belt the first item we got to put on? I want to give you three reasons. The first reason, this is on your notes, the belt 
protects me from entanglement. The belt protects me from entanglement. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14, in the American Standard Version, you've got to go back to the Old English to get these words, but it is absolutely word for word what the Greek says here. In the American Standard Version, it says this, Stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Yes, loins. Is anybody else uncomfortable with that word? Okay, that's why we changed it in the newer translations, okay? I guess they're uncomfortable with the word. But they said, listen, gird. That means strap, cinch down, and get that thing locked on. He says, gird your loins with truth. And I want to give you a visual image of what this would have meant for a Roman soldier. They didn't wear pants. Someone asked me the other day, like, yeah, so uh, why we got a belt with no pants in the armor? You know, that seems kind of weird. That's because they're thinking about the wrong kind of belt. You see, what happens here, if you haven't paid attention quite yet or you haven't figured it out, what happens is the, the Roman soldier would put his belt on, and it would be loose. But when he's ready to go to battle, he's not just walking around and looking good with his tunic, you know, kind of hanging down to the ground. When he's ready to run and ready to go to battle, he would reach down between his legs, grab the back hem, pull it up, tuck it into the belt, then he would reach down and get the other sides, bring them up, tuck them into the belt, and then cinch it to keep himself, when he's running, from entangling himself and tripping and falling so that he could go to battle. And so this is likely what Paul had in mind. And so we get tangled up in some things. Yeah? You ever felt tangled up? The scripture talks about sin as an entangler. That you can get so, so engrossed and so participating in sin that you become tangled. And it's very difficult. It's almost like a big, big ball of knotted yarn. And you're trying to unweave it and you're trying to untangle it and you can't. It's like this Gordian knot that seems impossible to unravel. And that's the way sin works. It entangles us. It trips us up. It causes us to hurt ourselves. Now get this. In the text, there is a tense that's used about the belt of truth. It says, having put on. And that suggests or assumes that every believer who has come to believe in Jesus and has committed his life to Jesus at least has put on the belt of truth. And this would seem to indicate that the truth that set us free when we became disciples is also the truth that can keep us free if we will utilize the belt of truth. With that said, though, don't go too far down that road because there's some false teaching out there that says once you put the belt of truth on, there's nothing that can happen to take that away. But notice this. It is possible to stray away from the truth and endanger ourselves. The promise of being strengthened to the point of being able to stand, that's another promise that God makes, but it's a promise with a premise. If we want to be able to stand victorious, we must choose to put on the armor that God has offered, starting with the belt of truth. Why do we put it on first? To keep ourselves from being entangled. To protect us. The second reason. The belt prepares me for engagement. Not like getting engaged to be married, okay? I'm talking about engaging in war, okay? It prepares me to engage. It prepares me to go on offense. In 1 Peter chapter 1, this is so cool. Peter says something very interesting. And in the ISV version, it's not quite as interesting, but I think it helps us understand what he means. It says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. That's what the ISV says. But notice what the New King James Version says. You can write this down if you want. It says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. You're like, what? My mind has some loins? <laughs> what do you mean? But he's using the same Roman... 
Roman army, uh, Roman soldier imagery to say, yeah, you've got to keep your mind from being tripped up. Anybody ever been tripped up mentally? Yeah? You ever heard someone say, you're tripping? Yeah. What do they mean? They're not meaning you're like this. They're meaning like you're crazy. You're tripping. It's because your mind has loins, right? And they need to be girded up. They need to keep from tripping over themselves. Our minds can really get us in trouble. Let me illustrate. Let's take a quiz. Y'all ready? We'll do it this way. All the If you think it's true, I want you to raise your hand. If you think it's false, keep your hands down, okay? Believe it or not, toilets in Australia, due to the different... Uh, sort of the way the gravity works in the land down under. Toilets in Australia flush backwards. True, raise your hand. False, leave them down. And now the real answer. False. Now listen, how many people have heard that before? Absolutely, I've heard that before. I've been in Australia and tested it, okay? So, <laughs> I know that this is false, alright? So, next. The unicorn is the national uh, animal of Scotland. For some reason, that's not showing up there. It's the national animal of Scotland. True, raise your hand. False, keep it down. The unicorn, really, guys? It's true. Yeah, it's true. Now, that sounds outlandish. The other one, that sounded reasonable, right? Come on. But, yeah, no, that's really the case. Like, it's really their animal. All right, let's keep going. The world's biggest snake was found in Africa, 134 feet long, and there's an image there of it. True, raise your hand. False, put your hand down. And let's see the real answer. It's absolutely false. That's a Photoshopped image. And yet, if that popped up on social media, you would, largely, people would just accept it as fact. There's so much, like, fake propaganda and fake news you know we heard a lot about that over the last few years um and let's let's keep moving the fly only lives 24 hours true or false true raise your hand it's absolutely false heard it all my life Heard it all my life. Go research it. You want, listen, I know some of you are doubting me already. Like, nope, not listening to another word he says. He's wrong about the fly. No, go look it up. Seriously, the fly lives not a real long time, but most of them live about a week. So it's still super short, but it's not 24 hours. That would be like, uh, that would be pretty, pretty amazing if you think about it. All right, how about the frog, if you hold it, gives you warts if it pees on you? True, raise your hand. Y'all afraid to raise your hand? It's absolutely false. The wart is a virus that's not passed by, you know, surface urine, okay, on your body. All right? That's not how it works. So frogs don't give you warts. You can play with them. They pee on you. It's just nasty. Wash your hands. You won't get a wart. All right? Bats are blind. True or false? True, raise your hand. You heard blind as a bat, right? It's false. They are absolutely, really, really good in their eyesight. Their eyesight is fantastic. And it's complemented by their, uh, what is it called? Um, sonar, thank you. It's complemented by their sonar. that They bounce these sound waves off of objects and it gives them better. So they're incredibly accurate. And that's why they can see at night. But they can see with their eyes as well. But... Lots of people think bats are blind. What else? If you hold a baby bird, what is the danger? You can't put it back with its family. Why? Because the mama will smell you and won't want anything to do with the bird. Absolutely false. Birds don't smell like that, bro. I'm just telling you, they don't, they don't have this keen sense of smell with like human. That's not happening, okay? It's completely false. So play with little birds all you want. Just be careful and give them back to their family when you're done. Empire State Building. If you stand at the top and you drop a penny off and it hits someone in the head down below, it will kill them. True? False. It's absolutely false. 
it will hurt like crazy. <laughs> but there's not enough velocity from the time. It, it's not going to accelerate enough. The physics does not back up that claim. It will just hurt and probably leave a knot on your head. All right. Do we have another one? Okay. Lightning never strikes somewhere twice. Raise your hand if you think it's true. Wow. Y'all are getting smarter. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so this is actually a picture of somewhere that it strikes hundreds, if not thousands of times every year, okay? And so it absolutely strikes the same place more than once, very often. And I think there might be, there's actually two more, I think. So the blood inside your body is blue until it gets outside of your body and then oxygen hits it and something happens and it turns red. True? Raise your hand. False? False? Lower your hands. Okay. Uh, false. Blood is red all the time, no matter what. Now, why, does it, why do you look and see blue? And that has to do with the different layers of your skin changing the hue of the red blood by the time it finally gets to the blood. But it is actually red inside your body. Here's another one. This is about to wreck all of your childhood lives. Who is that? Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. What else? All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. What is this a story of? An egg, right? Wrong. About to ruin your childhood. Humpty Dumpty, they actually found a cannon that used to sit up on a wall, and it was in a battle. During the battle, the cannon fell down and broke to pieces and couldn't be put back together to be used again in the battle. It's literally labeled Humpty Dumpty on that cannon. Interesting stuff, right? Why did I go through that exercise? Because something Winston Churchill said is so true, and it rings true today. Winston Churchill said this, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on. What does that mean for you and me? That we are at risk of being fooled. We're at risk of being duped into believing things that are not true. Now some of those things are very trivial. Whether you know Humpty is an egg or a cannon is probably not really going to change your life. But let's get a little more serious. Let's shift it into serious gear for a second. There are lies being told to you about what money is really all about. There's lies told to you about how you should handle money. How you never can have enough money. There are lies being told about where your worth comes from. And part of that is how much money you have. How big your house is. How many cars you own and how tall your SUVs are. Success in relationships. Whether you are single or whether you found someone determines your value. And if you're still single and you're getting older, something's wrong with you. Lies. But we, we, we feel like, like our appearance, ladies, you think your appearance is where you get your value. Why? Because you've been lied to. And guys have been lied to about what is beautiful, which is why they look at pornography. And things that they shouldn't. Because we've been lied to. We bought into these lies. About what will give us satisfaction. We've been lied to about our sexuality. We've been lied to about our eating habits. We've been lied to about our identity. Who we are. And who we're supposed to be. The world will tell you all kinds of things. And God's word is sitting here. And it's like, hey, just... I know all the lies, but you got to listen to me. you got to come to the belt of truth. You've got to accept truth. Lies about sin, being harmless and fun. I'm not hurting anybody else. And lies about living holy or, or going to church. That Man, that holy living and that church stuff, that's just boring. And it's repressive. It doesn't let me do and be who I want to be. All lies. And I bet you, to some degree, everyone in here has bought into one or more than one of those lies. 
And so he says, man, don't get entangled. Put on the belt of truth. Gird up the loins with truth. Gird up the the loins of your minds. Protect your minds from getting tripped up by all the lies that are being told. And then thirdly, the belt. This is why we put it on first. The belt empowers me to defeat my enemy. It's not just a defensive piece of armor. It is very offensive. It holds so many things. We've talked about this. It holds the breastplate in place. In place. If the breastplate were to sag down without the belt in place, then it would expose your chest. It would expose your heart. It would expose your lungs to a spear or an arrow. It held, It holds your shield, it has this little notch that the shield can rest in. And by the way, when we talk about the shield, I'll give you a little preview. The shield is not just to block arrows. It does that. But the way they would do it is they would line up, lock it into their belts, lock it into each other's shield. And they would count when the arrows were coming. And they would block together and sink. And then they would drop it and march forward on the enemy. So that they could go on offense. So that they could advance. And not retreat. The belt also had a clip where the sword hung. Everybody wants to talk about the sword. But the sword. You can't just hold it all the time. You got to put it away. The belt is so critical. Everything hinges on the belt. It empowers me to defeat my enemy. In John chapter 8 verse 44. Look at what is said of our enemy by Jesus. Jesus is talking to some folks that have claimed that they believe in him. And he says, you are, you are of your father, the devil. Oh, Jesus, that's kind of offensive. I think that's politically incorrect, Jesus. You shouldn't talk to us that way. That's what our culture would say. But Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth. Because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. The number one way Satan attacks us is through deception. He lies. And he gets our minds to get tripped up on these lies. To go way down the road believing these lies. And now Paul comes in in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. And I don't think this is on your notes, but just listen to what Paul says. He says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. Catch that. Human reasoning. That's where he says the stronghold lies. It's in your mind. It's human reasoning. And he says these, these mighty weapons of God also destroy false arguments. Some of you have very strong opinions about some things. But what if God holds a different opinion than you? What are you going to do? I'll never forget something Francis Chan said. He says, you don't like God's rules? When you get your own universe and you make it? You can make your own rules. But till then, you've got to figure out what he says. And you've got to decide if you're going to get on board or not. You're going to believe Satan's lies, or are you going to believe Jesus' revealed truth? If you'll accept and put on that belt of truth, you'll be ready for battle. You'll keep yourself from tripping up. You'll be protected from that entanglement. You'll be prepared for engagement. And you will be able to defeat your enemy. When you think about the belt of truth, don't think about this kind of belt. Think about like a plumber's belt. Or a carpenter's belt. A utility belt. Something that provides what we need for battle. Let's move on. The belt of truth is an interesting thing. There's really only one definition of truth, but I want to give you some different components of truth. And I think that there are three different components of truth that I want to talk to you about. The first one is this, 
And this is sort of, if you want to picture it this way, the belt of truth is woven with three different materials. The first material, it, it is affectionate truth. Affectionate truth. And what I mean by this is that truth is not just data, but it is a loving relationship with Jesus. That that is part of truth. That You see, the word of God was from the beginning. He spoke the creation into being. It was through his word that everything came to exist. Let there be light, right? Let there be an expanse in the sky. And let me separate the waters from the sky. And then he says, let the waters teem with life. And let the livestock come onto the earth. And all these things. It was all through his word that everything came to be. And so, it's easy to think about truth as just information. But in John chapter 5 verse 39, it's also not on your notes, but Jesus is talking to some Jewish leaders and he says, Listen, you diligently study the scripture because you think that by them you possess eternal life. And he says, man, those are the scriptures that testify about me. They're about me. But you refuse to come to me to have life. You see, he was attacking this mindset of, man, when you read the Bible, do you just fill your head with new information? Do you just memorize scripture verses and you just feel smarter? Do you come to this sermon this morning thinking, oh, man, that was interesting. That's, hmm, I hadn't thought about that that way before. If that's all you come away with today, you don't come away with loving Jesus more or being drawn to him more, then I've failed. We failed. I've either missed it in my presentation or you've missed it in your reception. Because I'm telling you, the biggest part of truth is not that I fall in love with a fact. I don't fall in love with a historical evidence. I fall in love, I don't fall in love with a rule. I fall in love with a rule giver. I fall in love with the one that there's evidence for. That's different. I'm not, you know... You guys have heard preachers talk about all these like evidences of the faith, right? It's called apologetics. And it's so alluring. It's so cool. And it's so intellectually appeasing, okay? And you're like, yeah, we're right. Yeah, look at all that evidence. And some people fall in love with the evidence. And they forget that the evidence is proving that there was a God who sent his son to the earth who died for me. That's the truth that we want to have. We want to have this affectionate truth where we love Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's why Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. He loves us. In John chapter 6, verses 67 and 6 through 69, and this is in the message paraphrase, okay? This isn't a translation, but it's a paraphrase. Listen to what it says. It says it really well. It says, after this, many of his disciples left. They no longer wanted to be associated with him. That's sad. What he had done is he had taught them some very hard things for them to hear. They didn't like what he was saying. They thought it was too hard to understand. It was too hard to accept. And so a bunch of them left. They said, we're not following you anymore. Then Jesus gave the 12, his 12 apostles, their chance. He said, do you also want to leave? And Peter spoke up and said, Master, to whom would we go? You have the words of real life, eternal life. We've already committed ourselves, confident that you are the Holy One of God. You see, Peter had already given his affection to Jesus. He had already accepted Jesus' affection for him. It wasn't about information or data or facts or history or any of those kind of things. For Peter, it was a relationship. Where else would I go, Jesus? I think you have the words of life. I'm not going anywhere. I love you. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 38, and also verse 40, it says, and this is the famous command, right? It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest command, Jesus says, and all the law and the prophets hang on them. You think about everything that was ever said in the Old Testament. He said, all the law and all the prophets hang on this, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
It's about, yes, are there truths to be read and truths to be understood in the Old Testament? Yes, but its overarching purpose is to get us to love God, to embrace that affectionate truth that God loved us so much. He loved us first, and therefore we love him in return. We're about to take of the Lord's Supper. And you have these, um, this is what we use during a pandemic, okay? And uh, they're not the best, but they're safe. So we're about to take of the Lord's Supper, and we want to do it in this spot as we think about the affectionate truth. As we put on the belt of truth, one of the components is to understand God's love for us. That he died on that cross, that his body was beaten, that he shed his blood so that we could be together with him forever. That is a truth. But that's a truth about the one who loves you. Let's pray. God, thank you for your truth. Thank you, God, for Jesus who was true embodied in a person thank you that you loved us so much to send jesus on our behalf thank you jesus for enduring the cross so that one day we could be with you forever we don't none of us deserve that kind of love we did nothing to merit it and yet you extended it god i pray that that will be compelling to all of us that your love will compel us. It will, it will drive us to go out and want to love other people and to love you in return. So, Father, as we take this bread that represents your body, as we take this cup of juice that represents your blood, may we remember and may we be motivated to love. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. He came to live, to live, live a perfect life. He came to be, to be a living word of life. He came to die, to die so we be reconciled. He came to rise, to, rise, to show his power and might. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing, that's why we offer Him our everything, that's why we bow down and worship this King, cause He gave His everything, cause He gave His everything, He came to live. To heal, to heal and show the lost ones his love. He came to go, to go prepare a place for us. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship him. Cause he gave his everything Cause he gave his everything Hallelujah 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 Hallelujah
Jesse Gage is everything. Is everything. Cause he gave his everything. Cause he gave his everything. Cause he gave his everything. He gave his everything. Amen. So there's a second component to this belt of truth that's woven together with the affectionate component of the truth, and that is this. It is absolute truth. So not only do we have affectionate truth, we have absolute truth. Now, there are some people in the world that say there is no absolute truth. What do you say to a statement like that? Here's what I say. Are you absolutely sure? You see, because what they have done is they've made an absolute statement declaring there is no absolute truth. It's ridiculous. It's a self-defeating, self-flawed statement. It's inherently flawed. And so there is an absolute truth. And without an absolute truth, then chaos would ultimately reign. Because you could have your own truth. I could have mine. And we could say, agree to disagree. That's a give up statement. Agree to disagree? It's a give up statement. Find the truth and get on the same page. Does it take more work? Yep. But is there absolute truth to be found? Absolutely. You know, Paul's words used to describe Satan's attack reveal a pattern. The first word that he uses in this text in Ephesians chapter 6, the first word to describe his tactics is the word wiles. And if you remember from last week, it's where we got wily coyote, right? It's where his name comes from because he's wily. Satan is wily. He's always scheming and putting together blueprints to trip up the roadrunner. We're the roadrunner. Satan is the coyote. So the first word is wiles. The Greek word is methodos. It's where we get our word method. The word wiles is the word from which we get our English word method. The second word though that, he's use, that he uses is this word schemes or devices. And it's the marriage. Often the Greek words are multiple words put together. And so this, this word for devices is the marriage between two other words. The first one is mind and intellect. And the second one is confusion. So what is Satan's tactic? What is his scheme? To confuse you. To make the water muddy. To make things unclear. He wants to confuse our minds. He wants to play mind games with us. He doesn't want our minds girded. The loins of our minds girded with truth. He wants us to be in confusion. And get this. Where does absolute truth come from? It has to come from an objective source. Thank you, God, for giving us the written word. He gave us the word made flesh, Jesus. That's our affectionate truth, right? The one that we can latch onto and love, and he loves us back. But he also gives us this objective thing. Jesus is not standing right here next to us. But he gave us his words to guide us. And it is absolute truth. Paul would call it the very breath of God. He says all scripture is God breathed. Useful for correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. So that the, the man of God could be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's his very breath. It comes from him. The creator of all things. It is our owner's manual. If you want to change the oil in your car, do you just... Pick any oil? No. You go to your manual and you say, what kind of oil, what weight do I purchase for this vehicle? You don't just decide, well, that's the cheapest one or that's the prettiest bottle. No, you don't do that. You check the owner's manual. We are created beings. We have an owner, someone who made us. And he gives us the scriptures as an owner's manual. It makes all, the Bible, man, having the Bible, some people say, man, and this is the way we do our church, okay? We have, eventually, as we get bigger and we start growing, we want to do everything through small groups. If you're not a part of a small group and you want to be a part of a small group, come and talk to us. Put that on your communication card in the, at the end and put it in these boxes and we'll tell you more about these small groups. But our church 
disciples each other, not here. It's impossible. We can't be intimate like this. One guy talking, all, everybody else listening. So we get in these small groups and we disciple each other. And we get intimate in, involved in each other's lives. And we know each other's crap and we help each other through it. And this is a family. But we do that through these small groups. And we assign small group leaders. But get this. Over 90% of our church were baptized into Christ without any previous church background whatsoever. And you're going to put someone like that who's been a Christian for a year or maybe two and they're going to be a leading a small group responsible for sort of discipling and shepherding a group? What? How could you do such a thing? That seems irresponsible. Well, can I tell you that because we have the word of God that that's what makes you competent. You don't have to figure out what advice to give someone, you can simply take them to the absolute truth of the word and you can show them what God says about a matter. And so that's the beautiful thing about the word of God. It makes all who know and love it competent to know the truth on a personal level and confident to counsel others with it. In Romans chapter 15 verse 14, the message paraphrase again, it says this, that those who know the Bible are, quote unquote, well instructed, quite capable of guiding and advising one another. Do you need counseling? I think all of us do. When you hear that phrase, do you need counseling, you think about a psychiatrist that you got to go pay money to, and he'll probably just medicate you and kick you out the door. And God says, man, I have transformation power. There's nothing too big for me to handle. And then I give you my people that you can become a part of this family. And you can together come to my word and you can find answers to any and every problem that you will face in this life. That's why we are the Crossway Church. The place where the problems of life meet the power of God. Why? Because we're convinced that the word of God is good enough to help us get there. We don't have to come up with a big plan. God gave us the plan of redemption. Of transformation. You and I don't have to worry about coming up with the advice. It's already there for us to give. We simply point people to the scriptures. We don't tell them what we believe. We show them what we believe. Can I tell you? A lot of churches don't do that. You got people being asked questions. Serious theological questions. And they're just spouting off something that they've heard said from a pulpit. And they're not taking the time. To show people in the word of God, in context, what God is revealing about those matters. And I'm telling you, that's dangerous. You have some people that know just enough to be dangerous, and they're irresponsible with their knowledge. And they will lead people astray. That's not what putting the absolute belt of truth on means. It means that we rely on the word of God. That's why Jesus, and this is on your notes, in John chapter 17, verse 17. This is why Jesus, in one of his most famous prayers to the Father, he prays this. He says, use the truth to make them holy, Father. Your word is truth. Your word is the thing that's going to make them holy. The word holy means set apart for a grand purpose. It's your word that's going to put them over here to the side to be used by God for his special purpose. It's the word, the absolute truth of God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, in the voice translation, it says this. He employs every manner of wicked deception, talking about our enemy the devil, to while away, in other words, craft this evil plan to get them to go away, those who are destined for eternal death. And here's why they're destined to eternal death. Because they reject the love of the truth that leads to salvation. Do you love the Bible? See, we talked about, do you love Jesus? That's one thing. That's the word made flesh. That's the affectionate truth. But it's not a bad thing to love God's word. Whether you're talking about loving God's word as the spoken word or the written word or the word made flesh. The question is, do you love his word? Do you love that he tells us the truth 
100% of the time. Do you even have anyone in your life that does that? 100% of the time. People disappoint. God never does. If he's disappointing to you, you are misinterpreting or misreading the situation. Because he's always faithful. Third and final aspect of truth that we need to recognize. It's authentic truth. And this, by this I mean, this is an honest presentation of who I am. Do you honestly present yourself as who you really are? Or do you just put on a facade? You wear the nice clothes, you put on a fake smile, you tell everybody everything's fine. It's fine, it's fine, like that TikTok, right? It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. How you doing? Oh, I'm great. Sometimes we say, how you doing? I'm too blessed to be stressed. We even like make it religious and weird. The point is, we're just lying. Because we know that something is wrecking us. Like there's something weighing on us. There's stuff that's going on in our life. There's stuff that's messing with us. It's making us question like Kyle when he was doing his intro. He's like making us question our faith. Man, somebody almost stole my daughter. What would I have done? Like there's stuff going on. Are you going to be real about it? Are you going to talk about it from a stage? Kyle, thank you for your great example. That's not easy to do. He's up there choking up and hard for him to get it out. That's, but man, are we going to be authentic? We're we just going to be frauds, fakes. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 24, Paul says this. May grace be with all, notice this, who sincerely love the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Why did he put the word sincere in there? Because there are some that don't sincerely love him. There's plenty who sing, I love you, Jesus. Who, if they are asked, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah, I intellectually believe in Jesus. That's not what Paul is talking about here. He's saying, do you really? Do you really, genuinely, sincerely love Jesus? Like you can't live without him. Here's another one. In Psalm 51, verse 6, the same word pops up of sincerity. It says, sincerity and truth, they always go hand in hand. Sincerity and truth are what you require, God. God is not okay with just truth. He wants sincerity. He wants authenticity. He wants you to be genuine, to be real. And then that's why the Hebrew writer says in chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. You want to draw near to God? You better get real. He doesn't want your fake stuff. He wants all your crap. He doesn't want you to try to clean yourself up and come to him. He wants you to come to him in all your nasty. Unashamed, saying, God, I own it. This is who I am. Help me. And not be ashamed. That's another lie of the devil. Oh, no one's going to accept you if you tell them this. No one's going to. No one's going to love you anymore if they know that about you. They're going to distance themselves from you. That's the furthest thing from the truth, by the way, for this church, I promise you. I guarantee you that most of the stories that you would hear from the 25 people that came here to plant this church would probably make your head spin, and then you'd feel super comfortable sharing your stuff, okay? We got some stuff, is what I'm saying. There's nothing to be ashamed about. None of us are here because we're good. We're here because God is good. And he's helped us get through some things. Some really bad things. You know the Latin word where we get our word sincere. The Latin word is sin sera. Do you know what it means? Without wax. What? Why without wax? Look at this picture. It's a cracked pot. Anything, you could make a statue and have a crack in it. They used to make idols that people would bow down to and worship. I went to India a couple of different times. I've been to India. And both times I went to these temples, these Hindu temples. And outside and all around the mountainside, there's these giant statues. These giant, and they're these gods and goddesses that these men and women have created out of stone. And we were driving past one day, 
And off in the distance, I saw this giant pile, something red. And as we got closer, it looked like the size of a bus, like a school bus. As we got closer, I noticed that's peppers. Like they have these giant mounds of peppers. And they were like scattered all over. Like I'm talking about like 50 buses worth of these peppers. I'm like, man, that's why I'm on fire every meal that I eat here. They love peppers. But then I look on the other side, and I see in the distance, and we, as we get closer, I realize what we're passing. It's a graveyard, literally, that's what they call it, a graveyard for idols that have been cracked and damaged and destroyed. And so all these gods are just sitting over there, like, with one leg off, you know, and stuff, and looking crazy. And, and I'm like, what do they do with all those? And I'm like, well, some people try to repair them and replace them and stuff. Let me get to my point. Anytime there was a cracked pot, they messed up in the making or the baking as, there, as it was hardening, it cracked or got damaged. Most honest and sincere pot makers would scrap that and not sell it. But the insincere pot makers or insincere idol makers or you know whatever they were making, they would add wax. They would melt the wax and let it go into the crevice, into the crack. They would wipe it down clean. They would paint over the top of it, and it would appear as there were no cracks. There was nothing wrong with the pot, and they would sell it for the same price as a really good uncracked pot. And so these pot makers began putting signs above their store that would say, Sin Sarah pots. In other words, we sell nothing but sincere pots that have no wax. Because you see what would happen is the people would buy these pots thinking they're perfectly fine. And then they'd put them out in the sun. They'd put water in it or something. And before they know it, the sun melts the wax down. And now the water starts coming out of the pot. And they realize they've been duped. And so now, ask yourself, do you have this false appearance of everything is fine? Or do you approach God with sincerity, without wax? Without pretending that you're something that you're not. In Mark chapter 12 verse 14. It says this. Teacher, we know that you are true. (laughs) Jesus was sincere. We know you are true. And you don't care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed. But truly teach the way of God. That's what Jesus was all about. Did it make people mad? Yes. Did they like what he had to say all the time? No, they didn't. It made a lot of people very angry. People say, man, why can't you be more like Jesus? He was so compassionate. He didn't judge anybody. Listen, are you serious? Do you know how Jesus' story ended? They were so mad at him that they killed him. I've had people mad at me. No one's killed me yet or tried to. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like I need to up my game and get more like Jesus. Like, get more offensive, get more in your face, because that got him killed. I'm up here preaching something that apparently y'all are like, man, that was nice, you know. I don't, that's not the goal. I I heard someone say this one time, if Jesus was the preacher of the church, it wouldn't, it it might grow at first because everybody's like enthralled and want to get, but then he started teaching something hard and the church would shrink. Jesus would never have a mega church. Because people would be too uncomfortable and too unsettled by what he had to say. He truly taught. He wasn't swayed by the culture or by the nonsense and the lies that were going around. He just told the truth, like it or not. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says to his young apprentice, he says, they will maintain. He's talking about this group of people. He says, there will be a group of people that will maintain the outward appearance of religion. But they've repudiated its power. So avoid people like this. He says they'll have the appearance of godliness. But they'll deny its power. He says have nothing to do with that kind of people. It's going to look amazing. The church is going to be a great show. It's going to be a great production. Lights, cameras, action. It's going to be awesome. He says but they have not tapped into my power. No lives are really being transformed. Truth is not really being embraced and buckled on. They're just putting on a show. He said, avoid those people. Why would he say avoid them? Why why avoid these frauds, these pretenders? Here's why. They're not only dangerous to themselves, they're dangerous to anyone that would be around them. And here's why. 
in Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 and 15, it says, Great, this is Jesus. He says, Great sorrow awaits frauds and pretenders. You do all you can to keep people from experiencing the reality of heaven's kingdom. Not only do you refuse to enter in, you also forbid anyone else from entering in. Great sorrow awaits frauds and pretenders, he says. For you will travel over land and sea, he tells this group. He says, you'll travel over land and sea to find one disciple, only to make him twice the, the child of hell as yourselves. I didn't say it. I read it, okay? There's a lot of pressure taken off of me, man. I just read Jesus' words, and if you don't like it, take it up with him. He says, man, you got to avoid pretenders. There's great sorrow waiting for those frauds and pretenders. And here's why. Because they're dangerous. They're not only going to keep themselves out of heaven, they're going to keep other people out of heaven because people are going to believe their lies. People are going to believe the lie that I can just check off. I went to church this Sunday and I did the rituals and I, did, I went through all the motions. I'm good with God now. That's a lie. Has nothing to do with it. We are here today to spur each other on to go out and be and to do what God says. Not just to come and have our ears tickled for a little while or our intellect, you know, stimulated. Only to go away into the same old, same old again. Let's finish this way. I want to give you a note. The belt is woven. We talked about three materials. The affectionate truth. The absolute truth. The authentic truth. Here's another way of thinking about it. The belt is woven of who I believe. What I believe. And how I believe. See the connection? Who do we believe? Jesus. What do we believe? His word. How do we believe? With sincerity and authenticity. We let it do its work in our lives. So I want to give you some commitments I want to challenge you to make for yourself. This is your choice. But if you want to make these commitments, write them down. I will buckle down, like the buckle example. Buckle down to build my relationship, my personal relationship with Jesus. Secondly. I will buckle down to build my personal knowledge of God's word. And thirdly, I will buckle down to be authentic and accountable with my life. Let's just talk about this for a second. You can leave those up there for people to write them down. Will you commit to seeking a relationship with Jesus? If you open up your bulletins, not only did you have a set of notes, you had a communication card inside. If you're ready to commit to pursuing and seeking a personal relationship with Jesus, you, you say, listen, I know about Jesus, but I don't know that my relationship is quite what it needs to be. Maybe on that communication card, you put in your information and you check, I want a personal Bible study. Because how do you get to know Jesus? You get to know him by where he reveals himself. Where he reveals himself is in his word. Or let's go on down the list. I will buckle down. Say you want to make this commitment. I'll buckle down to build my personal knowledge of God's word. Again, how can you start that? Say I want to study the Bible, man. Somebody will sit down with you and help you. Studying the Bible on your own. Anybody ever just said, all right, I'm going to study the Bible. You sit down. You just open up. And it's like, any, many, money. That's where I'll start. And then you end up in some random chapter that makes zero sense at all. It's like in some strange language even. Like maybe it's a King James Bible or something. You're just like, what am I reading? Shakespeare? You know, what is going on here? This is confusing. I don't get it. What is the, where do I start? Why does, how does this make sense? Listen, be humble enough to say, Somebody help me. Man, I remember. I didn't grow up in church, man. I didn't grow up knowing the Bible or knowing anything. We didn't pray over meals. We didn't do anything. So I went to this private school in eighth grade, and I remember everybody else there knew their Bible. They knew, they'd say, turn over to 2 Corinthians. I'm like, second who? And I'm like, I don't know where that is, you know. And, I, and so I'm sitting there taking an hour to find this, this book or this letter. Everybody else is already there and way ahead of me, and it was so embarrassing, and it can be embarrassing. But you don't have to be embarrassed here because you're in a room full of people. This church is a room full of people who have been there. They've been the ones embarrassed. They've been the ones that didn't know anything. Okay? You're in a safe place. 
Maybe you say, I want to buckle down and I want to be more real. I want to be more authentic. I want to be accountable. The only way you can do that, maybe you check, hey, I want to know more about your small groups. I want to know how to I plug in. I want to be a part of what you're describing. That y'all, are y'all really a family? Cool. I want to be a part of that. I want help with my marriage. I want help with raising kids. I mean, man, has anybody just found the handbook on that? How to do that just right yet? You know? But I think there's some folks that can offer some assistance. There's some folks that have some things to say in that area. We can help each other as we wrestle through this life thing. Back to the relationship thing, and I'm going to be quiet. Raise your hand if you know Michael Jordan. Raise your hand if you know Michael Jordan. All right. Raise your hand if you know uh, LeBron James. Raise your hand if you know LeBron James. Okay. So that's like old school goat, new school goat, right? Most people would answer that question, yeah, I know. Let me ask you this. If he came here, would he know you? Then you don't know him. Not in the biblical sense. A lot of us know Jesus the way we know Michael Jordan. We know about things he said. We know about things he did. We could tell you things about him. But if he showed up, would he say he doesn't know you? You know, that's some of the scariest words in all the scriptures. In Matthew 7, verse 21, you can go look at it on your own time. But he says, many will say to me on that day, talking about judgment day, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and perform many miracles. And then it says, Jesus says, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. See, it's not about knowing about him. It's about being in a relationship with him. If you want to know more about that, fill out that card. Guests and members alike, everyone, this is your opportunity to take the word of God that you just heard and this is your first chance to do something with it, with the stroke of a pen. I'm going to pray, and our singing group, our worship team is going to sing a song while you fill that out. And then we'll sing one final song to, to get us out of here and dismiss us. And you can drop those things in the collection baskets back there. If you're a member, also drop in your contribution. Just a reminder, we got to have some things to keep the ministry alive and running. If you're a guest this morning, please do not give us money. We don't want your money. It's not that we wouldn't appreciate it, okay, but we don't want your money. We want to give to you this morning, and we want to be identified as a church that gives, not a church that takes. Let's pray. God, thank you. You're so good. You desire a relationship with us. You desire to protect us. You desire for us to put on your armor. You desire to reveal your truth in the face of all the lies of the enemy. God, we've got to embrace that. We have to choose to put on the armor that you freely give us, that you paid for with the blood of your son. God, help us not squander the resources, the tools that you give us to go into this life better prepared. I pray that everyone here this morning has been blessed by what they've heard, but I pray more than that, that they will do what they've heard, that they'll commit to something, Father, that you'll prompt them to be brave enough. They got here, that was brave. In the middle of a pandemic,